Something's wrong with this footage, but what is it? Well, it isn't the resolution, the frame rate, the image compression, or even the color grading. No, this footage has a different problem. Smooth gradients of color have been replaced with ugly splotches that make everything look like it's being streamed through a dial-up modem. However, as I said, I haven't messed with the compression of this video. And the reason behind this ugly banding is actually the perfect intersection between filmmaking and computer science. Today, we're talking about bit depth. In the days of analog film and video, there was no such thing as bit depth because there were no bits. But in the modern era, almost all video production is done digitally. Instead of using optical printers, chemical reactions, and dedicated electronic circuits, all of the image processing is done using a computer. A digital video is really just a long stream of numbers, and the processing is done by doing complex math on those numbers. But why does this matter? Well, while digital workflows have countless advantages over older analog techniques, it also has some limitations which are inherent in any sort of digital technology. So to understand bit depth and how it affects our images, we first need to learn some computer science. In a digital camera, the analog signal coming off of the image sensor is converted into a long string of numbers which can be processed and then stored by the onboard computer. However, the important thing to understand is that when computers store lists of numbers like this, they don't have the luxury of spaces, commas, or paragraph breaks. Inside a computer's memory, all you have is one long string of numbers back to back to back to back. There's nothing to indicate where one value ends and the next begins. So when the computer wants to read a particular value, it might know where to start reading, but it doesn't know when to stop reading. Is this supposed to be 113 or 11 and 3? Or maybe 1 and then 13? There's no way to know. There are a few different ways to solve this problem, but the most common one is to make it so that every value is the same length. Let's say we make it so that every value in memory is two digits long. That way when the computer goes to read a value, it knows that it should always read the first two digits and then stop. Okay, so this solves one problem, but it also creates new ones. See, if every value has to be a fixed number of digits long, then that means there's an upper limit to how many different values we can represent. In our example, every value is two digits long. So this means we can only represent numbers up to 99. Storing anything larger would require a third digit, which breaks our storage scheme. Okay, so let's make it so that every value is three digits long instead. Well, this allows us to store values that are 10 times larger, but it also means that our data will take up much more space. Remember, every value must be the same length. So even if the number could be represented by just one or two digits, it's going to use three anyway, so that it can be read properly. As you can see, the more digits we use, the more numbers we can represent but the larger our file becomes and the more processing power will be needed to manipulate it. Now, let's take a look at how this applies to cameras. Let's ignore color for the time being and just look at black and white. In a digital camera, the image sensor produces an analog signal, which represents the intensity of light that was recorded by each pixel. This analog signal then needs to be digitized and converted into a series of numbers for the computer to process. So let's say once again that we decide each pixel's value should be two digits long in memory. Now every sensor has a minimum and maximum value that it can output. So let's say that the sensor's minimum output is zero and its maximum output is 99. Since the maximum possible output is mapped to the maximum possible value, we don't need to worry about generating a number that's too large to fit within two digits. However, there is a more subtle problem at play that we need to be aware of. See, in this system, there's no such thing as a decimal or fraction. There are only whole numbers. So what if, for example, the value reported by the sensor was somewhere in between 51 and 52? Ordinarily, we would just store the number as a decimal, but in this system, there's no such thing as a decimal. Our only choice is to round the value to the nearest whole number. 
but if all the values are being rounded to the nearest hole, then that means we're losing quite a bit of precision. Imagine the image contains a subtle gradient of color, and all of the values in that gradient fall somewhere between two whole numbers. Well, after the signal is digitized, that extra precision is lost, and all we have are these big bands of color roughly approximating the true values of the image. The severity of this problem depends on how much precision is being lost to rounding. If we decide to add an additional digit, that unlocks an additional decimal place of precision that we can use to store more subtle variations in brightness. The more digits we add, the smaller and less noticeable the banding becomes. So how many digits do cameras use? Well, as I'm sure every programmer has been screaming at their screen this whole time, computers don't actually use the base 10 counting system we're all used to. I've been using base 10 to make things easier to understand, but computers actually store numbers using a base 2 or binary counting system. Now binary might seem intimidating, but really it's just a different way of writing numbers than we're used to. Basically, instead of each digit representing a different power of 10, each bit represents a different power of 2. Binary can represent any number that our ordinary base 10 counting system can. It'll just look different. For example, here's the number 13 represented in decimal. There's a 3 in the 1's place, so that's 3, and a 1 in the 10's place, so that's 10. 3 plus 10 is 13. Easy stuff. Now let's look at the same number written using binary. We have a 1 in the 1's place, a 0 in the 2's place, a 1 in the 4's place, and a 1 in the 8's place. 1 plus 0 plus 4 plus 8 equals 13. It's the same number, just written differently. So inside a computer, everything is represented as binary numbers, but the same principle applies of assigning each value a fixed number of bits in memory. The more bits we use, the more precisely we can store information coming off of the sensor. In the earlier example using decimal, each additional digit increased the number of possible values by a factor of 10. Two digits allowed us to represent 10 to the two possible values, three digits allowed us to represent 10 to the three, and so on. It's the same in binary, except each additional bit increases the precision by a factor of two instead. Most consumer grade cameras use 8 bits per number, which means there are 2 to the 8 or 256 possible values. However, at this point we need to move away from the simplified black and white model and acknowledge the existence of color. The color at each pixel is actually represented by three numbers, one for each of red, green, and blue. Each of these numbers is 8 bits long, so we have 8 bits per color channel, or 24 bits total. While the individual channels only have 256 possible values each, when you combine them together into a full color image, you end up with 2 to the 24, or 16.7 million possible colors. And honestly, this is plenty for most purposes. Pretty much every SDR video you've ever watched has been encoded using 8 bits per channel. Quick aside, the 8-bit per channel standard is often referred to as 8-bit color, which is technically incorrect since 8-bit color would only have 8 bits total, which means there would only be 256 possible colors. Retro game consoles like the NES used actual 8-bit color, but usually when someone says 8-bit, they actually mean 8-bit per channel. It's technically incorrect, but language is what it is, and I call it 8-bit too, so it's fine, I, I just wanted to mention it. Anyways, most digital video is encoded with 8 bits per channel, which is fine for most purposes. However, even though I'm delivering this video at 8 bits per channel, I'm actually recording it with 10 bits per channel. Why? Well, like a lot of things, it has to do with color correction. See, it's very common for video clips to be filmed using a log gamma curve to preserve as much dynamic range as possible. However, shooting in log with 8 bits per channel of precision is actually a big problem, and here's why. Since most log formats attempt to squeeze a very high dynamic range into a small container, they tend to have very low contrast compared to a standard gamma. This isn't a problem by itself, since the color correction process often involves using a color space transform to convert the log footage back to a higher contrast format. 
but when we increase the contrast of a clip in post-production, we're also amplifying the contrast between the bands of color, which means they'll be more noticeable. Even though the 8-bit container would allow for a smoother gradient here, the camera never recorded the necessary information, since it performed the 8-bit compression relative to a lower contrast gamma curve. Effectively, recording in a low contrast format and then increasing the contrast in post will lead to more noticeable banding than you would get from recording in a standard gamma in the first place. But recording in log has many other advantages when it comes to color correction, so simply avoiding log formats isn't really a solution. What we need to do is record in a log format, but with a higher bit depth. This way, there will be less contrast between the bands in the first place, so increasing it in post won't create as much of a problem. And this doesn't just apply to changing contrast either. In fact, almost any sort of color correction will create gaps in the gradients of the image, which will need to be filled in. And the more extreme color correction you apply, the worse this problem gets. You can get away with it to some extent, but eventually the banding will become severe enough that the image just starts to fall apart. Recording in a higher bit depth gives us more precise color information to work with, and allows us to perform more extreme color corrections before the footage falls apart. For example, here's a side-by-side -side comparison of two clips with the same extreme color grade applied. The only difference is that one is recorded with 8 bits per channel, and the other is recorded with 10 bits. Even though you're watching this video in 8-bit, the 10-bit footage is still noticeably better, because when you apply an extreme color grade like this, you'll need to start with more than 8 bits of precision in order to create a clean 10-bit image after color correction is applied. So since gamma curves with a higher dynamic range require more extreme contrast corrections, they also require a higher bit depth in order to create a usable image. So already we can see that there's a bit of a trade-off between dynamic range and bit depth. But complicating things even further, we also have to consider that different gamma curves might use the bits available to them more or less efficiently. As I mentioned in an earlier video, the whole reason why we encode video using a gamma curve is to distribute the available bits more efficiently than would be possible using a linear gamma. But that doesn't mean that there's one ideal gamma curve which works in all situations. A particular gamma curve might be more or less efficient depending on the dynamic range of the format. The standard gamma used by SDR video is optimized for SDR, but it isn't very efficient when trying to encode HDR. And similarly, the PQ gamma curve used by most HDR standards was specifically designed to minimize banding when extended out to 10,000 nits. So as you can see, the balancing act is between dynamic range, bit depth, and efficiency. Higher dynamic range will require more bit depth to achieve the same level of banding, but this can be offset somewhat by using a gamma curve that's more efficient for that dynamic range. So with all that in mind, which bit depth should you use? Well, pretty much the only downside to using a higher bit depth is the possibility of larger files. But unfortunately, that doesn't mean you can necessarily start shooting with a higher bit depth right away. Almost all consumer cameras are limited to recording in 8 bits per channel, which means you'll need to be careful about using log, and you probably won't be able to grade the image too heavily before encountering issues. 10-bit color is usually restricted to professional grade video cameras, though there is a growing trend towards enabling 10-bit on lower end models. Now, 10-bit might not seem like that much of an improvement over 8-bit, but remember, that each additional bit actually doubles the amount of precision, and moving from 8-bit to 10-bit means adding two additional bits to all three color channels. This increases the number of available colors from 16.7 million to over 1 billion. So generally speaking, consumer cameras record in 8-bit, professional cameras record in 10-bit, while cinema cameras often record in RAW with either 12 or 16 bits per channel. But remember, we also need to consider the efficiency of the gamma curve when deciding which recording format is better. You might think that the 16-bit RAW offered by cameras like the Sony Venice is inherently better than the 12-bit RAW offered by companies like Arri and Blackmagic. However, this isn't necessarily the case. 
While 16-bit RAW formats do have more precision, they also use a linear gamma curve, which means they aren't using the bits very efficiently in most cases. In contrast, most 12-bit RAW formats utilize a log gamma curve to more efficiently distribute the available bits. So the point is, while different approaches might be better or worse for different situations, you can only compare bit depth apples to apples when the gamma curve is identical. All right, so when it comes to choosing a bit depth for your capture format, the choice is largely made for you by the manufacturer of your camera. However, when you're working with footage in post-production and need to render an intermediate file, you do have a bit more freedom. High quality intermediate codecs like ProRes, DNX, or Cineform often use either 10 or 12 bits per channel to maintain as much precision as possible when transferring between applications. Finally, let's take a look at the bit depth used by common delivery formats. As I mentioned before, almost all SDR video is delivered at 8 bits per channel, though some higher end standards do use a higher bit depth. For example, even though most movies are delivered in SDR for the theater, DCPs still utilize 12-bit per channel encoding in order to keep banding to a minimum. Additionally, HDR video is typically encoded at either 10 or 12 bits per channel, since it has more dynamic range than SDR and therefore needs more bits in order to achieve the same level of banding. So at the end of the day, it's important to be aware of both bit depth and gamma curves whenever you're choosing a format for image capture, processing, or delivery. Most of the time, an appropriate bit depth will be chosen for you, though there are some situations where making the wrong decision can lead to an ugly mess of banding that I showed you at the start of the video. And on top of all that, I just think bit depth is the perfect embodiment of the intersection between filmmaking and computer science. Anyways, I hope you all enjoyed this video. My name is Cayman Crocker, signing off.